Dear colleagues, dear guests, engagement of scientists in media debates, especially on polarized and toxic topics, is a very timely topic that will be a key focus of today's lecture by Fiona Fox. Dear Ms. Fox, a very warm welcome here in the lecture hall of our university as the Nature Moselius Visiting Professor for Science Communication for the summer semester 2024. We look forward very much to your talk with the title, Toxic Public Debates, Why We Need Scientists to Engage in News More Than Ever. The Nature Mazilius Visiting Professorship for Science Communication is a joint initiative of Holzbrink Berlin, the Klaus Chira Foundation, and Heidelberg University. These three partners are committed to promote excellence in science communication and to increase its visibility both in academia and amongst the broader public. It is my great pleasure to welcome uh, Christine Laule, yeah, sorry, <laughs> Head of Projects and Representative of Holzbrink Berlin, and Lilian Knobel, Managing Director for Education and Science Communication of the Klaus Schirrer Foundation. I would also like to welcome Volker Stollert, Managing Director of the Science Media Center Germany. We are delighted to have you all here. The Nature Mozilius Visiting Professorship Program allows us to invite outstanding experts to Heidelberg University to hold courses on the many exciting facets of science communication. At the same time, our visiting professors are expected to spark a broad-based discussion about new forms of exchange between academia and the public. Previous holders of the visiting professorship include, most recently, Mai Tin Yun Kim, Michele Catanzaro and Martin Enserink. Since science communication is crucial for all disciplines and for interdisciplinary dialogue, this visiting professorship is located at the Mazilius Colleague, Heidelberg University's Interdisciplinary Center for Advanced Studies. Thanks to its two directors, Professor Nössel and Michael Bo Professor Butros, and its administrative director, Mr. Just, the Mazilius Kulik is a wonderful think tank and incubator for interdisciplinary exchange and a very important catalyst for novel research projects that tackle complex challenges of our age. Dear Ms. Fox, I hope the Mazilius Kulik has been an inspiring home for you during the last weeks, a place where you could experience the joys of interdisciplinary exchange at our really fantastic university. Our current Nature Mazilius visiting professor and evening speaker, Fiona Fox, is the founding director and CEO of the Science Media Center in London since 2002. With a degree in journalism and extensive experience in media relations, she has been instrumental in shaping the landscape of science communication in the UK. Her contributions have been recognized through numerous awards, including the Order of the British Empire. Fiona Fox describes herself more as a science communicator than a science journalist, which is reflected in her approach to bridging the gap between the scientific community and the media. During her stay in Heidelberg University, Ms. Fox has been fully immersed in the scientific environment of the Mazilius Kulik. Her activities included the Fireside Chat, available on the YouTube channel of Heidelberg University, weekly seminars with the Mazilius Fellows, one workshop with the Young Mazilius Fellows, and four workshops with students, PhD candidates, postdoctoral fellows, and senior academics from a broad range of disciplines. She has also held numerous individual meetings with Heidelberg scholars from a very broad variety of disciplines. Tonight, Fiona Fox will address the vital need for scientists to engage in public debates, especially when topics become contentious such as climate change, vaccines, the coronavirus pandemic, and AI. As she aptly puts it, the media will do science better when scientists do the media better. Mm -hmm. Dear Ms. Fox, on behalf of Heidelberg University, let me thank you very much for the time you spent with us. We are all very grateful for your commitment and dedication and look forward very much to your concluding lecture. I will now hand over to Christine Laule, from Holzbrink Berlin, who will introduce our speaker, Fiona Fox, in more detail.
Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of Hot Spring Berlin, it gives me great pleasure to celebrate the work of Fiona Fox with you all this evening. Um, Professor Melchior already mentioned uh, the, the, the sentence, media can do science better when scientists do media better. This is a statement by Fiona that summarizes so much of her work and impact. As the chief executive of the Science Media Center in London, she has spent over two decades encouraging and helping scientists become better at engaging with the media. Um, she, besides her role as CEO, she is also the author of Beyond the Hype, the inside story of science's biggest media controversies. Published in April 2022, the book is part memoir of the first 20 years of the Science Media Center, and at the same time, it is a call to action to all who read it. Fiona's work has been crucial through many crises over the past few years, but I will mention just one here, both because it is still fresh in our memories and because it illustrates the vast impact of her approach. We all remember the importance of good science communication during the pandemic, whether providing information about the effectiveness of masks or helping us understand how vaccines work, we all knew that science communication was a life or death matter. During the fireside chat a, week, uh, a few weeks back, Fiona reminded us that was, what was truly life-saving during that time was not just doing the science, but communicating it as well. Fiona practices what she preaches by regularly contributing to the Science Media Center blog, which is widely read by scientists. She also often speaks on the issue of science engagement at conferences and festivals. To give you a sense of how topical her writing is, one of her most recent articles asks whether or not it is appropriate for scientists to comment on science in the news in the run-up to the UK election. She cites clear principles by which this commentary can and should take place. Quoting the exact local election guidance, she clarified this nuanced issue for scientists and press officers alike. This is a vital perspective as so many countries go to the polls this year. In addition to her lecture this evening, Fiona also has already personally contributed to the improvement of science communication in this community by speaking to our Heidelberg colleagues at several workshops. In the beginning of June, she led a workshop encouraging scientists to engage with scientific controversies and to actively shape media narratives. In her second workshop, she explored whether scientists should advocate for particular policies. In doing so, she acknowledged that this is an endeavor fraught with complex challenges and ethical considerations. With the help surveys of surveys and studies, Fiona equipped participants to examine the fine line between advocacy and activism. And just yesterday, she engaged in a discussion with Volker Stollertz the head of Science Media Center Germany, about the changing role of science communication. There, they analyzed the shift towards a more corporate and risk-averse approach in science communication. They warned that this trend jeopardizes open dialogue and undermines public trust in science. So we are very, very fortunate to hear Fiona speak tonight. And I can think of no one more qualified to reflect on the last 22 years of science media engagement with us all today. Please join me in welcoming to the stage the eighth Nature Mazilius guest professor, Fiona Fox. Thank you so, so much for those amazing introductions. Thank you for this incredible opportunity to spend a month away from my busy office and just thinking and debating with the incredibly, I see someone in the audience, smart, smart, interesting um, students at, at Heidelberg and academics at Heidelberg. I'm absolutely loving it, so thank you. Thank you most of all for choosing me over the football. I am very grateful. If I hear any cheers at the back, muffled cheers, I'll know that you're listening as well as maybe keeping an eye on the result. So thank you so much. So a few years ago, I met the newly appointed editor of one of the UK's best-known radio programmes. 
She greeted me with huge excitement. Ah, she gushed, you're the science lady. Oh, I love science. I once asked my science editor to look into claims by Gwyneth Paltrow that the sky in the UK is lower than in the US. And guess what? She was right. Oh, I'm so excited to meet you. I then watched this editor's disappointment when I explained that I was there to talk about the dangers of exaggerating the side effect of statins, the need to report research on deep sea mining for minerals, and the ethics of gain of function experiments. On my way back to the office, I reflected on why this editor had assumed that the science lady would be there to talk about the quirky story, otherwise known as the and finally, put at the end of news bulletins to cheer us all up. I thought about some of the stories I had worked on in the previous years at the Science Media Centre, the Fukushima nuclear disaster, the genome editing of two babies by a rogue Chinese scientist, the theft and release of 10 years of emails from a leading climate researcher used to argue that climate science was a hoax. No cheery and finally stories in that list. I knew that this editor had covered all these stories, but somehow in her mind, science lay outside of the news, in the world of space and dinosaurs, of gravitational waves, and of nerdy claims that turn out to be true. She was not alone in this view. Discussions about science communication often focus on the power of science to excite, to inspire, to entertain. Of course it can do all those things and they really matter. But for some of us, science communication is about so much more. It's about public trust in science. It's about the need for evidence-based policies. It's about countering misinformation. And it's about better informed public debate. In short, for some of us, science is news. My question for today's lecture is, how is the science community doing when it comes to engaging with the news? How are we doing on these messy, complex, contested, and sadly sometimes now, toxic science stories in the headlines? Back in 2002, when I was appointed to set up the SMC, the answer to that question was pretty badly. At the time, the UK was in the middle of several media frenzies. A scare story had linked the MMR vaccine to autism. Maverick fertility doctors claimed to have cloned the first humans. And headline writers had decided that genetically modified plants were Frankenstein foods. While scientists blamed the media for this sensationalism, one senior news editor made me think differently about where the problem may lie. In a speech to scientists at the Royal Society in 2002, Simon Pearson, a senior editor at the Times, said the following. You are doing better in the features pages and the magazines of the broadsheets who are covering science more widely than ever. But this is not the case on the front line of news reporting. BSE may have no link with CJD, and hard-working scientists may have got us out of a terrible mess, but the public has yet to be convinced. One renegade doctor may have destroyed the MMR programme, while best research shows the vaccine is safe, but the public have yet to be convinced. GM foods may pose no proven risk, and indeed may hold huge potential benefits for mankind, but the public has yet to be convinced. This is not solely down to the vagaries of an irresponsible press. It is also down to the failure of the majority of scientists to stand and be counted in the eyes of the public and to put their case across convincingly. With these words ringing in my ears, 
and with a goal to help improve the media coverage of science, I attempted to identify the reasons that scientists were failing to engage effectively. Several things struck me. An obvious one was the culture around public engagement at the time. Most eminent scientists didn't see it as their job to do media and dismissed those who enjoyed it as media tarts. Those scientists that did media often did it selectively, maybe speaking to a few trusted journalists on the day that their nature paper is published before quickly retreating to the lab. There was certainly back then no expectation that scientists should proactively engage with controversies that may stay in the news for weeks, for months, often even for years. Also back then, science press officers were few in number and way down the pecking order in terms of status and influence. Science communication was growing as a career path, but it was in its infancy. And this lack of engagement also had interesting implications in the newsrooms. The more contested subjects were often seen as the domain of general news reporters, rather than health, science or environment specialists. GM, for example, was covered by the consumer affairs journalists. And when the UK Prime Minister, Tony Blair, refused to confirm to the media that his young son was vaccinated with MMR, the story was quickly taken over by the political hacks. But don't despair. This lecture gets happier from this point on. <laughs> I promise. 20 years on, as I stand here today, I am pleased to report that this picture is unrecognisable. In the UK, there has been a quiet revolution in the culture of science, which has been extraordinary to witness and be a part of. Scientists now see engaging with the media and the public as part of what it means to do good science. Science communication as a field has grown and professionalised. And science, health and environment journalists are the front line of science reporting. As has been said, this new culture was clear for all to see during the COVID-19 crisis. Media work was not left to the science popularisers, but seen as a critical part of science's contribution to the pandemic. Professor Sarah Gilbert, the scientist who developed the Oxford AZ vaccine, had never courted or enjoyed media work, but she understood at a deep level that it was no use to develop an effective vaccine if the public didn't trust it and didn't see her. She did no less than four press conferences with the Science Media Centre to talk journalists through every stage of her results. Professors Martin Landry and Peter Horby ran the recovery trial, testing which existing drugs could help patients in hospital. These scientists didn't pass their results to politicians to announce or say they were too busy running those trials to speak with journalists. They did SMC press briefings every time they had new data showing that one of the treatments either worked, dexamethasone, or didn't work, hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> Over the two years of the pandemic, that the pandemic dominated the news, hundreds of scientists did media work, ensuring that the public and policymakers had access to measured, accurate, and evidence-based information. This was science communication at its very best when the country most needed it. Without a doubt, it saved lives. So what had changed to deliver these improvements? Several things. I like, of course, to think that the SMT has played our part. But to an extent, we were set up because scientists had already recognised that something had to change. Like the churches, politicians and the trade unions before them, the science community recognised that they too had to emerge from the shadows and earn their licence to practise from the public. When universities and funders began to champion the importance of public engagement and even to incentivise researchers to do it, things really started to change. The phrase media tart disappeared, thankfully, 
replaced with an expectation that scientists would do their research and then communicate that to the public. And critically for me, engaging with the public came to be seen as part and parcel of what it means to be a good, science, good scientist. The culture change was also fueled by successes. When the SMC opened, as has been said, we coined this phrase, the media will do better when scientists do media better. Of course, things don't always go our way, and I have many scars to prove it. But there is now ample evidence that when good scientists engage in a timely, open and honest way, we reap the benefits in improved media coverage. The disasters of MMR, GM and designer babies have been now replaced by positive case studies. In 2008, the UK government did a major U-turn on a parliamentary bill to ban research on human-animal hybrid embryos. The media and others credited the government's change of heart to the scientists themselves speaking up, explaining the benefits of this research. And these people highlighted the stark contrast with previous controversies where the scientists were nowhere to be seen. Glowing editorials in the Times and the Financial Times celebrated the fact that the scientists had finally found their voice. The media coverage of climate change, of vaccines, GM, all improved during this time, making it easier for us to recruit good scientists to our database. Perhaps most remarkable for me was the transformation of the debate about animal research. The science community moved from treating this part of life sciences as their shameful secret to be hidden, to actually inviting the media into their labs. Many universities now proactively publicise the number of animals used each year, explaining why and the benefits that come to society. What happened as a result of this new openness on animal research? The UK media lost interest in the row and started to report animal research as a standard part of the biological science. For example, journalists reporting on the new COVID vaccines in the UK simply stated that preclinical studies had taken place in primates. This cultural revolution has been wonderful to be part of, and it's worthy of celebration. But I have to issue a warning. Like every revolution, we must work hard to maintain these gains and not be complacent. In recent years, I have seen a range of changes and trends which I fear may set us back. I don't have time to characterise them all, nor do I fully understand them yet. Sorry, I'm smiling because I can hear the cheering. <laughs> Seems like a second girl to Germany. Um, nor do I fully understand them myself yet. But let me highlight a few and we can discuss them over questions. Firstly, I see more and more research being pulled into the orbit of government and therefore subject to more controls and restrictions from government press officers and communications officers. In 2018, Paul Nurse, our Nobel Prize winner, talked very proudly of how he had helped to set up a new centralised funder called UK Research and Innovation, which would place science at the heart of government, resulting in more funding for science and more influence. Paul was right, but there was a price to pay. The change effectively put the communications of seven previously independent research councils into the hands of political press officers. I am assured that science now has a much stronger voice inside government in the UK, but I fear this has come at the expense of its voice in the public discourse. Another trend I worry about is the more corporate communications culture that I see in some universities and research institutes. Marketing, reputation and brand communications are rising in importance relative to research comms. Some senior PR managers in universities I have spoken with now view science mostly as a supply chain of great stories to help attract students and funding 
and enhance the reputational brand. This is true, of course, and great, but not surprisingly, this approach does not always sit well with our requests for scientists to speak out in very polarised and contentious debates. Another barrier, a very sad one, is the rise in harassment of scientists on social media, which has undoubtedly put many off raising their heads above the parapet. Culture wars swirl round every public debate now, with keyboard warriors either claiming scientists for their side or placing them in the enemy camp. Layered on top of these trends, of course, is the changing media landscape. When we started in 2002, the only way press officers could get their science to the public was via the news media. Today, of course, they have many new ways to reach their target audiences. These digital and social media platforms allow science communicators to feel more in control and more able to tell the positive stories that the news media may not like. This is great. I really welcome it. But bypassing journalists and the news media also means avoiding media scrutiny and can reduce openness and lead to a loss of public trust. Let me leave you with some good news. Unlike politicians and journalists, scientists don't have to first win the public's trust. Many, many different polls show that engineers, doctors and scientists are right at the top of the groups that the public trust to tell the truth. Scientists are trusted, often with trust ratings of over 80% compared to around 10% for politicians. In our polarised times, when campaigners, politicians, influencers and commentators all vie for public attention, we need the calm, measured, impartial and evidence-based voice of science more than ever. It's not easy. It needs courage. It needs resilience. Most of all, it needs all of us in this room to notice when the voice of science may be being silenced or constrained. Scientists are in the news, the headline news. They're no longer just the and finally, but society needs it to stay that way more than it's ever done. Thank you for listening. Many thanks, Fiona, for this great and inspiring talk. And I think we have now time for questions from, from the audience. Um, I think you are right that uh, the scientists were successful in Great Britain during the COVID period. But in Germany, it was very different in some parts. And in the United States, the picture is very different and uh, the scientists aren't listened to. Why do, you think it's, uh, why do you think it's so different in different countries? Oh, that's a hard first question. <laughs> I, I'm not sure that everybody would agree with me that it was all great in the UK. Better. 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 So I suspect that it, there was a lot of good stuff in Germany and a lot of good stuff in the US. But, but may be drowned out by the bad. But I know I certainly saw in Germany, I saw many, many great scientists in the media speaking out. You know, there's a whole separate lecture on, on the way some scientists behave as well, and, and kind of maverick scientists who are completely speaking outside of their lane of expertise and loving um, the media spotlight and being really confusing. So I think that there was an issue there. So I don't want to exaggerate that all of the scientific community, but I do think they, they were heard and I think the media coverage, and I think without them, things would have been worse. I know um, I listened to the uh, Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, which is a very good school of looking at journalism, and they always caution me, um, don't look at the media in America. Don't look at the media in the States. Not that it's not interesting, not that it's not endlessly fascinating, but it really is not typical. 
It really is not typical. And actually, I would say, whoops, I would say that's what we all want to avoid, isn't it? A kind of polarized media where, you know, the Republican Trump supporters listen to Fox News and they don't want face masks and the Democrats listen to something else and they want face masks. The idea, I think, that's a real fear um, that we start basing who we listen to on, on what media we consume. So I think it's, we, we should look to those countries to kind of say we can do better than this. Question over there. Uh, um, I just wanted to ask, because considering that the professional field of science communication is still, compared to other professions, a bit younger, what advice could you give someone who's interested in becoming a science communicator slash journalist? So, so yesterday when Volker and I did our, um, our, our workshop, seminar, um, there were about 25, I think, and they're, they're mostly PhD or young scientists. And actually, I left it to the end. I should have done it in the beginning. At the end, I said, do any of you want to work in science communication? Actually, about six or seven put their hands up. So, and Volker and I were both very positive, you know, even though we'd said some things about some of our concerns about the kind of research communications disappearing, um, that's not settled yet. So I, I, I would really, really encourage you. It's a wonderful career for somebody who has done their science undergraduate, maybe a master's or a PhD, but they don't want to leave the field of science. And actually for me, we need those people in science communication. What I worry about is the kind of people coming in with government background or commercial background because you have to market the university, that's fine. But we need to protect the space in these research institutes for, for communicators who care not just about the organisation, the institution, but getting good, accurate science out there that have this kind of imperative that at times it's about good PR for my institution, but if there's a pandemic or if there's a climate crisis, it's about more than that. It's about the knowledge that is in this institution being communicated in the public interest. So I would very much encourage you. I also, I know Volker and his colleagues and uh, myself and my colleagues, we talk, we have an intern program. We have coffees with, with young people who want to go into science communication. We kind of see it as a, we champion the field and we're always available to help you, advise you. And we also tell you where not to go. Um, so sorry if there's any government here. I think if you want to be a, a political communications expert, go and work for government. It's a fantastic job. Um, but if you want to do science, I think we, we, can, we can advise you. <laughs> it's a very clear message. <laughs> it's a question over there. I've seen it. Your, your thoughts on the Avermectin debate? Uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear it. What do you think about the Avermectin debate? Ivermectin, you know Iver Ivermectin? Oh, yeah. Ivermectin, yes, yeah. sorry, 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 I got it, I got it. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, I'm not a scientist, I'm a science communicator, but I think um, that is a key job of the Science Media Centre. So all of these claims, that is, a, I'd say it's one of the most important things we do. There are all these claims swirling round about which drugs, I mentioned hydroxychloroquine, people will remember when Trump got COVID, he was immediately taking hydroxychloroquine, putting it out, and um, so I think getting the best scientists who are, who are experts in that field to look at the papers that were coming out. I think there were, we had an infodemic in the pandemic, which was very difficult. Thousands and thousands of new science, science papers. We had preprints, which was very new, in, in, certainly in life sciences, where people, of course, ethically couldn't wait to publish in the top journal, so they were putting stuff. So you just had all this information. I think some of the claims were coming out in preprints and being put up in the media. And um, so we see that as a key, a key issue for the science media centres to get third party scientists to look at these claims, to look at what is in that particular paper or what's being claimed, but also to bring their 20, 30 years of expertise to, to test those claims. And to just not, not always to say this is right or wrong, but to urge caution, to urge journalists, please don't put this on the front page that this works. You know, you can report it, of course, but you should say that leading scientists in that field uh, urged caution or said this would have to be put into a, a human trial or, or something like this. Yes, uh, thank you for your interesting talk. <coughs> 
Uh, during COVID, I had the impression that the media took on a very self-righteous role, acting as gatekeeper of what the public could know. In looking back, uh, would, was this a positive or a negative development? Oh, that's so interesting. That's, um, that's one for over wine, I think. But um, certainly we, so, we, we, we divided. So there will be wine afterwards. So. <laughs> um, yeah, we debated quite a, I mean, on the whole, I feel so positive about it. And I felt I was proud of the scientists for stepping up and I was proud of the health and science journalists for the role they played. I think they were, in fact, some, we, we sometimes smile because they were so responsible, what I would call responsible, in those two years. And then suddenly the pandemic is over and they're back to coffee causes cancer, vaping kills, and you're like, come on guys, go back. But, but, but also interestingly, um, sometimes I think you're right, like the um, side effects of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is now very much demonstrated, the blood clots with low platelets. I think some of the journalists were almost trying to play that down themselves. Now they felt this responsibility that they didn't want the pub, they wanted the public to know that this was a rare side effect, that you were much more likely to die of blood clots if you got COVID, so please get vaccinated. So I think it was coming from a good place, but I think to a certain extent they were all, and, and obviously the risk of that if the journalists start kind of not giving a lot of attention to claims of side effects, that's also risky because then the public trust is lost and now it's completely confirmed that that was a side effect then. But on the whole, honestly, I, th I thought they did really well. And also, actually, on that particular debate, I had a, a, a very, that was Winefield as well, a very lively debate with someone who said the media hid that and government hid that and that just was not true. We ran press briefings on that side effect and the Pfizer side effect and it was out there and the government were talking openly about it but I think there was a, a totally understandable sense of we've got to report this side effect without saying to everyone this is a dangerous vaccine don't take it so to get this message out that it was very rare but I like your question I think it's really interesting. Question at the very rear end. Thank you very much for the talk. Could you please uh, speak a little bit more about the tension that might be between this emphasis in universities in marketing, branding, um, uh, reputation, and the, part the personal participation of scholars in the public discussion. Yeah. So thank you for that. Um, it was the subject of one of my workshops here. So one of the wonderful things about this uh, visiting professorship is you get to choose the subjects and, and then you get time to think and I've really kind of been thinking about this recently. I think some of it is the changing nature of universities. Um, in the UK, Tony Blair, our Prime Minister uh, way back, decided that 50% of people would go to universities and that really changed the nature of universities and of course then the fees. Um, so they have to pay £9,000 um, um, per term and they want a good education and suddenly the language is changing that universities are kind of selling an education and that their students are also customers. So there, there's so much happening and then the government in, in the UK in the last uh, few years has been very critical of universities and politicised a lot of the issues. So, so these um, kind of new, it used to be a route that if you were research communications, you could get these top jobs, director of communications in a university. And now we've really noticed a change, like there's a kind of glass ceiling for the people <coughs> coming through that route. And they're attracting people from a government background, change management skills, reputation skills. And I guess my warning is, <coughs> those people bring those cultures. So you bring your culture, if you've worked in government for 20 years, which is about kind of managing, managing the messages, um, promoting the brand of these universities. Um, and I, don't, I, I can feel myself saying this as if it's a criticism. I don't think it's a criticism. I think universities do need um, th these kinds of people. But I'm fighting a little battle to say, can you protect the space for research communications? You know, Louise, ah, the VC of Oxford University, Louise Richardson, um, did a lovely speech at the uh, first anniversary of the vaccine. And she made this comment about, you know, finally, people now know what Oxford University is for. You know, they used to think it was where posh people sent their children to grow up for three years. And now they see 
that, that this is a place where the vaccine was made to, to uh, prevent COVID and the recovery trial where they discovered those drugs. So I keep quoting her to say to some of these very senior cons, but the research is the reputation. The research is the brand. People will come to this university because you're telling the stories of the research. Um, so, so that's it. I gave examples at my, my workshop of, of certain issues that, that the universities were saying we prefer our academics don't get involved in this. You know, debates over the origins of, of COVID between lab leak and natural origins or Grenfell Tower, a, bit, a big fire we had in the UK, which was a massive story. We, we'd prefer it, Fiona, if you don't ask our academics. Not very nice debate. And um, so that is what we're just saying no actually that there's academic freedom and these scientists are qualified and they want to speak but they need support and encouragement um, they can't just be let alone because of harassment and whatever so I think there's a bit of a battle on we spoke about this earlier of science communication probably if I may dare say it is probably a little bit more advanced you know we definitely kind of were pioneers in this career path and this professionalization and I've watched that with great joy and really loved it as, you know, research institutes go from one ex-scientist who was doing a bit of part-time PR to a team of four, five, six research press officers. It's just lovely. Everyone I employ um, are these young scientists who want a career and they go off and do great jobs. But I just think now, 25 years into this, maybe there's something that, that we need to have a new debate about what is the role of... Um, science communications in these kind of senior, senior parts of universities. Hello, um, I have uh, two questions actually. Uh, first one, what on it? Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> then um, just one. Uh, so <laughs> one, one per person. What do you think? Well, what is your opinion about um, how far scientists should enter into the public debate when it comes to evaluating? the um, effectiveness of policies, let's say in climate change, for example, you think it should be, they should say something about that or just really about the research, about oh, climate change itself? These, these are, I feel like Tobias has gone around and paid you all to ask great questions. So uh, we, had, we had a course on that. <laughs> um, so this was, again, also one of my uh, workshops. I have to say, it, it, I think I was the least convincing, and, and I think um, the uh, funders of this program will be pleased to hear that, because this was a very open debate, and I did not convince um, the people in my workshop. But I'm going to try again, because you've asked me this question. So I was trying to say that I think scientists need to be careful about this, about moving from being the people that do the science and gather the data, and yes, 100%, then speak to the media about that data on climate change and, and explain what's happening. But then there's another step. Do they become a, an advocate for particular policies? The climate is changing, and therefore the government must do this. Um, and that bit, I think, I would like people to consider whether there are any dangers of this. And I think it goes back to my speech about these different actors in society. There's the commentators, there's the politicians, there's the NGOs, there's the campaigners, and I worked for all of those. And if you're a campaigner, you exaggerate and you shout and you force an issue onto the political agenda such that politicians listen to you, and that is the rightful role. Um, if scientists become more advocates and campaigners for particular policies, I worry that they lose this. You know, I told you about the 80% trust. It's worth looking at some of these as engineers, 90, scientists, 80. Um, and then these NGOs and campaigners are much further down the bottom. So I fear if for good motivations, they lose the very trust that actually allows. I think um, NGOs and people should say to scientists, great, we'll take your data and oh, we'll lobby. But actually, if you become lobbyists and campaigners, it could be that you lose public trust and we need you to be trusted. And also, uh, one of the things I think, again, I didn't win this argument, but one of the things I sometimes think is the power, the power of the data. So, you know, even in the pandemic, you've got, I remember, I'm, I'm standing in the middle now, but there was Patrick Valance, our chief scientific advisor, Chris Whitty, our chief medical officer, every day on uh, televised debates and no one else, everyone was locked down at home, so they had to watch them, showing graphs. They had graphs. 
and uh, infection rates are going up and up and up. This is going up and up and up. And Boris Johnson says, we see this, but no, we've decided the economy is more important. We, we will not shut down. Did they, and people phoned me up, why didn't Patrick Vallance condemn him and say, we must have a lockdown, we must go uh, close schools? I said, did they need to? Did they need to? There's loads of people in the media saying we must lock down. But actually the power, and also, frankly, and this is an important point, if they'd have done that, they'd have been sacked. They, they would no longer be the advisors to the government. Would we have been in a better position? I don't think we would. So, you know, as I, I've probably communicated to you that choosing between scientists and government, I like scientists. They're, I'm on their side. But we have to acknowledge that if politicians don't trust scientists because they're being political and they're advocates and they're taking a side, then we lose something. So, so I'm going to be, after my um, month here, I'm going to be more modest and I'm going to just raise it as a question. Whereas I think in the past year I've been saying, please, you know, people come to press conferences, I'm going to demand this action. And I say, please don't do that. There's journalists coming, just tell them what your data found. It's powerful. The extent of ice melt, you know, which has changed and you've done three years and you've found the data. You tell the journalists and then they will go and they'll find loads of people to give a political comment. But we can talk later. I don't know. I, I didn't convince everyone. <laughs> One of them said, if that's true, my last 20 years life's work has been wasted, if you're right. <laughs> so. There's a question over there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I really liked your point um, about, you know, be, be mindful about one's position as scientist and not you know, thinking too much ahead of, uh, uh, of, of one's result, maybe with regard to political efficacy and so on. But um, often it seems that it's the politicians that need to be reminded about the role of science and educated about that. And that many are the results that are published or, you know, in the media become then instrumentalized uh, in the public discourse. And I was wondering, about you know how, how one should deal with that when one sees one's result basically in the newspapers being voiced in a completely different way, decontextualized uh, in in a in a discourse that is not their own. I to I totally agree with that. Um, and and in fact, we the the pandemic was such a horrific time in so many ways, but it was also an incredible time. And you've reminded me of. Do, do, um, that image I just gave you before, which was the prevailing image of, in the UK, Boris Johnson, the Prime Minister, with these two scientists at his side. And a few weeks in, I thought this was great because I could see that the scientists were, the public were seeing the scientists every day and the scientists were getting there, you know, 20 minutes to explain. I was very for this. And then I can't remember what day it was, like two, three weeks in, all the questions that, oh uh, yeah, we're just following the science. We're just following the science. Now there was about 20 different policy options open to governments, but we're just following the science. And so I ended up, which I could never have done, you know, one of my other phrases is science in the headlines is an opportunity as well as a threat. And I always say that because I think people see, oh my God, Frankenstein foods. But of course, if you're working on GM technology, if it's on the front pages every day, it's an opportunity. Um, and this one, I just thought, uh, how do we get over this thing? There is no such thing as the science. On, on COVID. This is three months in, of course there isn't. The immunology wasn't clear, the infectious, you know, whether, the, whether we would ever get a vaccine. So I got Brian Cox, our most fi famous science communicator, and the Venki, the head of the Royal Society, and a couple of other people into a press briefing. No one would have come if I'd have done this in normal times to say, is there such thing as the science? Um, and that was exactly what, what they were saying, which is, if you hear politicians say, I am doing this policy because of that paper in that journal, that's not right. There, there will be hundreds of papers on any issue, and they have to weigh up the science, and maybe they also have to weigh up other things, you know, that, that, that they have to take. The electorate does actually matter to politicians, but be honest about that. Be honest about that, and that's where... And by the way, I also think, um, you know, I'm not sure about scientists becoming strident about political positions, but when politicians misuse the science, I do think they should call it out. That's straightforwardly. They don't have to condemn or lambast, but they absolutely should call that out. So yeah, I agree. Question over there. Hello, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, mention your experiences in 
whether or not science communication has changed with the advent of the accessibility of AI to create um, fast fake news systems and whether you have any advice on how scientists could combat that in, the, in social media as well as in yeah. journalism? Actually, I don't have that much advice. I did, um, I did hear from a friend that uh, if you're a head of communications, you have to do a communications plan a communication strategy. It's one of the things that when you, when you rise up from being a press officer and you're talking to journalists, you become the head of communications. You're the person that's responsible for the planning. What is this research institute gonna do for? And, and a lot of them hate it because you're not seeing the journalists, you're not out seeing the scientists, you're sitting in a room doing this, or what are the priorities and how do we serve the priorities? It's, it's the, the, the price you pay for being um, a more senior person but it's very important. And one of those said to me recently, it's fantastic, Fiona. I used ChatGBT and asked for the, the communications plan and I got it. And then, and then if you're clever, you get the basics that every good communications plan follows and then you put in what you, the, the things you need to add. So I've come across communications people using AI as a tool to help them in their job and, and to get rid of some of the things that are just a pain to have to do. But, but not really more than that. I, I, yeah, it's actually, I mean, a lot of these things, it's every single day we put out AI scientists out in the media because it's that existential threat. AI is going to kill us, you know, um, the, these robots will become intelligent and eat us all and Elon Musk thinks this. And so we're very involved in the debate, but in terms of the actual applications, I mean, I think the, uh, the other side of it, apart from the existential threat, is just trying to uh, run press conferences about the incredible benefits of, of these new big kind of data sets and AI and looking through all the cancer um, oh, sorry, I keep doing that. Um, so the, the benefits of AI we talk about, but no, I don't have many examples yet of it actually being part of the life of communications people. There's, <clears throat> I think I've seen another question over there and then one over there. Um, so you uh, talked about that there's a lot of trust in science, but there are also people that have an interest in undermining the trust in science, for example, climate change denier who want to undermine science and come up with alternative facts. Um, how do we combat those? How do we combat those rhetorics and um, gain a lot more trust in science with the 20% that doesn't trust science? Yeah. Um, I, I, I think fairly straightforwardly by, by doing what the science media centers are calling on scientists to do, which is to have their say. Um, and I think if, if you look actually um, a, about the kind of history of the skeptics, when we came in that story I told you about the theft of 10 years of Phil Jones from the Climate Science Unit in UEA, um, it was, ho was horrible. It was really, really horrible. And the skeptics just dominated the media. One thing I remember about that story was it took us about a week, and we're very fast, to find somebody who would go out in the media and defend climate science. Because they kept saying, but Fiona, I haven't seen these emails. I know they're out there, but there's thousands of them. And maybe he did do something wrong. And I said, maybe he did do something wrong, but it doesn't undermine the whole of climate science. And, and some of the data that Phil Jones at, at the uh, Climate Research Unit was looking on, we also knew that the Met Office was and the WMO. And you need to get out there and you can say, of course, um, I'm not going to answer questions about Phil Jones or his emails or interpreting what he said to this one or that one, but I'm definitely going to sit in this TV studio and tell you that climate change is, is good science. It is not a hoax. It is, is safe. There is a scientific consensus. But it was hard. They, they didn't want to, And that's, I think this is why this is the theme of my lecture, that when things become polarised and, and nasty, um, people, that, that's when they don't want to enter. My argument is that that's when you have to enter. You know, in that week, can you imagine in that week where climate science is a hoax and the, they, they, and a, a bit like the animal rights people, the animal rights people used to give it all to their favourite journalists who then did it, and, and we took that back from them. But in that week, the, the, it was none of the science journalists were covering it and they were phoning us and we couldn't get them scientists. Meanwhile, happily, in every newspaper and every news outlet, climate skeptics were interpreting these emails. Um, Phil Jones, poor guy, was like utterly couldn't speak. We were saying, get on, the, get on the train, come to London, speak to the journalists. He was just a broken person. So it was very, very, very difficult. But on a daily basis, I'm much more positive than that because I think there is lots of um, 
anti-vaxxer information circulating. I think there is lots of climate sceptic, but I don't think they're, they're winning. And one thing I would caution is quite a lot, and I've had it in, in the last couple of weeks from younger people saying, you know, everybody is, is, is listening to these anti-vaxxers and that's actually not true, is it? I mean, I, I don't know what your vaccination rate here was, but if that was true, no one would have been vaccinated. Most people in the UK were vaccinated. The, the groups that weren't had very good ethnic minorities who don't trust government for good reasons, and they, they were a group that tended not to. But honestly, most people in the UK took the vaccine. So there must be something going right. And again, now all the parties in our general election back home are vying for, we will take action on climate change. And I think back to some of these individuals who I remember, I used to have nightmares about them, who dominated the media 20 years ago, the climate skeptics, they are, they are nowhere. So I think we're making progress, but I think the message is you can't vacate these debates. Um, if, if, if this in, misinformation and anti-science stuff is out there, the only way I know to counter it is to, to be part of that debate. Question over there. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> um, apropos climate change, um, how do you, how would you think to keep people interested in a topic like climate change that's out there and people know about it. And I think, I don't know, at least in my bubble, like it's not really a question anymore, but it's, it's like, it, it sounds like a broken record a little bit. So how would you engage scientists more in a topic that's widely known and where the urgency is clear and maybe you don't have much, to, much new things to add yeah. yeah, I think that is a real challenge, and I know um, I know quite a few of the environment journalists who are so committed to keeping this in the news agenda, but who are struggling with their editors. I have a very good friend, Tom Heap, who's the climate reporter on Sky News, and he had a, a programme every Saturday, uh, which I used to watch, a half an hour programme on all the different news, which was incredible for a mainstream news channel to dedicate, as well as other news. Um, and I just met him recently and said, oh, they're going to finish it. The kind of feedback from the, the audiences is that they're not that interested enough. I mean, I think we still, the science of climate change, where there's new data, one thing I always say to people, don't, don't, don't allow a big new study to come out on climate change ever and just put a little press release out and just let it dribble out. You know, really, you know, call the journalists in, have a press conference, say this matters. So keep giving them, you know, news. And science is wonderful because it has this kind of steady stream of new findings. And, and be honest, if, if things are a bit more complicated than you thought and maybe climate change isn't going in exactly the direction, there's that. There's also the fact that things do uh, move and maybe that's not a bad thing so the science of climate change is is not so contested now or debated um, but what we do about it and I don't mean by then what policies I mean which technologies which technologies can get us to net zero and there's always a row about those do you want carbon capture there's a big row at the moment in the UK about a funder giving a lot of money for geoengineering very controversial why are you geoengineering the planet we should just uh, stop climate change happening now, but we've done, we're doing briefings on that. So, so I think there is still lots of news, but I think partly it's the science and environment journalists coming to us and saying, Fiona, what, what help can you give us and personalising it and all of that. But there's a certain extent to which we have to accept some of that, I think. In the, in the pandemic, it felt too soon for me that they lost interest, and a lot of these journalists were saying, oh, our readers don't want any more, that enough. It's too depressing. There's a big report out by this Reuters Institute that I uh, mentioned earlier in the last week about people just turning off any news. A lot of younger people, just enough now. I just want to go on TikTok and have fun. And so there's an element of which it is our, it is our responsibility to do everything we can to keep that in, but we don't run the media. And, there's, that, you know, to, and to an extent, editors have a good sense of, of what their readers and their viewers want, and that will sometimes not go in our favour. I think there's probably one of the last questions over there. Thank you for your talk. One question, how do I explain changes in likelihood to an audience with no statistical knowledge? Um, <laughs> I think the, we, we, we run statistics training for journalists twice a year and it's remarkable how many journalists turn up. There's a guy, None of you have ever heard of him looking up Professor David Spiegelhalter. 
who is um, amazingly, Heidelberg should think about this, the Professor of the Public Understanding of Statistics in Cambridge University. Um, we also, we, we, when we are doing this thing that we do, where Volker and I do, where you get third party comments on a new study, we very often get statisticians to try and explain in, in easy, accessible terms about the statistics of that. But, but that, I think, mostly the answer is, is education. It's about educating people in schools to understand statistics. Our job, I think, is that when it is in the news, acknowledging that people don't understand statistics is getting great media-friendly, articulate statisticians to help explain that. And one thing I haven't talked about much tonight, but about, about being honest as well, about uncertainties and where the gaps in knowledge and that whole thing for me is really important. I, I, I was visited by a very senior government communications person during the pandemic to say, Fiona, um, I just, I, I've been asked to come and see you. You've got to go, stop your scientists from disagreeing with each other. You know, we've got to put a clear single public health ma message out on lockdown, on shaking hands, on face masks. You're not helping. And I just laughed for five minutes and said, number one, chance would be a fine thing. And number two, I wouldn't even if I could. You know, it isn't that they're all disagreeing for the sake of it. They don't know. They don't know. And there are different scientists who <clears throat> look at the same data and interpret it differently. And, and that's great. And I want the public to see, back to my point, about a scientists are a distinct group. They are a distinct, and I like it. I came into science 22 years ago thinking, like all my other jobs, I'll do five years here in science and then I'll go on. And then I came in and I found these guys who, you know, they care about the truth and they have an idea, but they test it and then they wait three years to get it peer reviewed and then they wait to get it published. And I really like this. Um, so I want scientists to be scientists and to be open about the fact that they're all disagreeing. And, you know, maybe the theme of tonight, maybe we can learn something from the way scientists disagree with each other and test each other and reproduce each other's results rather than just shouting at each other, I'm right, I'm going to convince you. So. I think many of us are very sympathetic to that. Mm -hmm. The question over there. What would have been your advice to Galileo Galilei in his fight with the Pope about the sun-centered <laughs> universe? Do you want to say that one, Volker? <laughs> he was just talking to the students about this yesterday. No, I mean, I often talk about Galileo because, um, as I see it, he had a very, very serious uh, problem to address. And the problem was that what he saw through his telescope uh, in the general public, nobody could believe because they didn't feel it and they didn't see it and they, they couldn't understand. I mean, the sun is going up and down and the earth is not moving around. And that's what he was saying. So it needed the whole enlightenment that more and more people accept that what they feel deeply on Earth, we stand here on the Earth and we don't feel that it's moving very fast and we don't see the Earth, uh, the sun is going up and down. So to understand the idea that what you really uh, seem to know, uh, to accept that science is having a different truth, that's a big problem and it needed the whole enlightenment to get somewhere. And then the, mm -hmm. the church, of course, and that was another dispute about who has basically uh, the truth in it, and the church basically said, well, to Galileo, that's what she said, uh, Cardinal Barberini told him, if you do it just as an hypothesis, that's fine with the church, because we have the truth, we read the Bible, I don't care if it's mm -hmm. just an hypothesis, but Galileo basically, and science is saying, no, this is truth, this is the evidence, and that was basically the conflict, so the church was not ready at the time to give what is known what is knowledge to the scientists because they wanted to say, well, if this is not true, what we say, then there will be chaos in society. And it took the whole enlightenment to change that whole idea. And we now have to take care that we don't go back again, that we all feel that this is bad for whatever reason, and we don't listen to the, one, the guys who were trying to find the truth, and then we will return back to an age maybe even before the Enlightenment, and sometimes if you look to the United States in certain parts of the uh, democracy they have, we are almost there that we again split up into two or three or whatever 
uh, diversity. So I think uh, Galileo, at the time, he had no choice uh, to fight against all this uh, political and religious order. He was, but he and his ideas took hold, and that was basically the Enlightenment. It came later. Mm -hmm. I think we also have to come to the end. Um, I would really like to thank Fiona Fox again for giving a great talk, but really also having an inspiring discussion. <laughs>